my name is Michelle Hines, and I'm the Executive Director of Inside Out Reentry Community. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to day two of Inside Out's Reentry uh, Summit Homecoming. We are fortunate to have so many interested parties and supporters here in attendance. Uh, we are very grateful to the City of Iowa City's Human Rights Commission for their sponsorship through the Social Justice and Racial Equity Grant. I'd also like to thank the University of Iowa College of Law and the University of Iowa Liberal Arts Beyond Bars for their support helping plan uh, this event. I'd first like to bring up to the stage a longtime and outspoken supporter of criminal justice reform as well as Inside Out. Um, she is a Johnson County Board of Supervisor. Let's welcome to the stage Supervisor Roy Sand Porter. Hello, everybody. On behalf of Johnson County, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, for me, Inside Out is special. Um, I talk about this program all the time, and I, when you know so many people who has been incarcerated, um, being able to give them the resources as to where to go when they come home, not knowing when you come out of prison or if you've been to jail, whether or not you know, you know to find affordable housing or employment. So inside out, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Johnson County. I'd like, I like to welcome you to the Inside Out Reentry Summit. Inside Out Reentry Program helps citizens returning from incarceration secede from the inside out. Thanks to the staff, <laughs> excuse me, thanks to the staff and all of the participants in today's summit for participating and helping us to understand the challenges facing the many men and women returning from prison to find a faith-based community where they will be welcomed, supported, and encouraged as they learn to adapt to life outside of the prison walls. Across the, across the country, men and women are being released from prison and are looking for people and churches who they can depend on and who can help them navigate what for many of them is a new and for foreign world. Here in Johnson County, um, one of the I've never heard anybody other than us doing this. Um, Inside Out, it's just awesome. This, this whole program is just awesome because we here in the state of Iowa, Johnson County, we thank you. People are just thankful to be able to go to this program, be a part of this program. Every Thursday they meet, um, get together, talk, tell their stories. And some of the stories are heartfelt and hurting, but with Inside Out, we're able to help these people. I like to thank Inside Out for being a part of um, their executive board. Um, I like to be uh, thank Inside Out for being a part of when they first started in 2014, sitting down talking about Inside Out and the things that we wanted to do to help these people. So, on behalf of Johnson County, thank you and welcome. My name is Dorothy Whiston, and I am on the board of Inside Out, and it is my privilege this morning to introduce our keynote speaker. I think I got the honor of introducing Mitchell S. Jackson this morning because I've become a vocal fan since reading his most recent book, a memoir called Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family. You all have a brief bio of Mr. Jackson in your summit brochure, so I'm not going to recount all the accolades that his novel residue years received, nor list the many publications he's written for, nor recite his many academic achievements. His resume is pretty impressive, though, so do take a look. I will simply note Jackson's courage and honesty in telling his personal story in survival math his wide-ranging and in-depth knowledge of the historical, cultural, and even philosophical influences on the world we live in, if the world we live in and so on our lives. I also want to lift up his amazing facility with language that moves smoothly between street vernacular, erudite yet accessible prose, and compelling poetry. I'll add right here that when I first met him this morning, the question burning in my mind was, 
when you write, do you make up words? And he laughed and he said, yes, I'm glad you noticed. So a few times reading his book, I would go in my mind simultaneously, is that really a word? And that's the exact right way to say that. So he's very creative with language. He's creative in a million ways, but um, that, that was fun to discover I uh, wasn't just ignorant. Um, but the things that I really want to lift up about Mitchell Jackson's writing are his compassion for the people he writes about and his sense of hope. No matter how painful, even raw, this telling of his own story gets, or those about his family and friends, he always comes around to respect, compassion, and an unquenchable and ultimately contagious hopefulness. If reentry is about anything, it is about hope. And Mitchell S. Jackson gets what hope is about. He knows it's not rosy colored or easily fulfilled, but he also knows that it is a powerful motivator for personal and social change. Please join me in welcoming Mitchell S. Jackson to the podium. All right, hello. I'm going to raise this a little bit. Uh, how you all doing? Uh, I want to thank everyone for waking up early and, uh, and making this. Uh, I don't know if you're early risers, but I'm not normally an early riser. And uh, I'm very thankful that, uh, to see faces in the audience. I'm very thankful for that uh, lovely introduction. And I'm so glad you noticed my neodulism. Like, really. Um, thankful to Michelle. Um, for inviting me. This is my first time to Iowa. Uh, I woke up this morning and, and uh, looked in the mirror and noticed that the mirror was an eye in the shape of an eye. Um, so I know <laughs> there's some real pride going on in Iowa. I've never been to another state and saw the mirror in the shape of the uh, name of the state. Uh, so uh, for that, I'm very thankful that I had a new experience this morning. Uh, okay. <laughs> Y'all got mirrors shaped like eyes? Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> when I uh, get these kind of invitations or find myself in these spaces, uh, I feel very thankful, um, obviously, to the people that invited me, but then I also think about the kind of context that allowed me to be in this space. Um, and so the first thing I want to do is uh, pay some thanks. Uh, you probably won't know any of these people, but they are still responsible for me being here in front of you. The first one is my mother, um, who had her own struggles, but really showed me what uh, unconditional love was, even when it didn't seem like she loved herself much. Um, the other one is my uh, non-biological father, a guy named Big Chris who's passed, but uh, who like took me in and um, really showed me what a father figure was when he didn't have to. Uh, my mom actually went to prison for a little while, and when that happened, I had to go and live with my biological father, who came around when I was about 10 years old, and so I'm thankful to him that he opened up his home for me all those years later and, uh, and gave me a, a place to stay. Um, I actually ran away from my father's house uh, and ended up, uh, after some kind of short stays, living with my grandfather. And uh, so, again, very thankful to him for opening up his home to me and, and really giving me a, a stable home. It felt loving uh, while I was in high school. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of other people, you know, I had uncles and cousins, you know, that would look out for me and make sure uh, not uh, terrible things weren't happening to me. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, coaches. I play basketball, so I'm very thankful to all of them. Uh, and. It might seem strange, but when I was a drug dealer, there was a guy that got caught with a lot of my dope. And instead of telling on me, which I probably could have done a very long time in prison, he didn't. And he ended up doing eight years. So uh, that would have changed my life. Um, and so I really have to say thank you to him. Um, 
another kind of crew of people that might seem ironic that I think are um, the guys that robbed me. Uh, I was a nice guy when I was a drug dealer, which also made me a target. And there were not a lot, but more than a few guys who pulled pistols on me. Uh, and so I'm thankful that none of them actually pulled a trigger, you know, because it could have worked out a lot different for me. Uh, and then the last few people I'll thank are the police officers that arrested me. Um, the night I got arrested, it was a really dark, I was on the street, I was driving my car, it was really dark out. And um, I had a pistol in the car because I had been robbed so many times. And uh, the officers shined the light in my car and saw the pistol, uh, really kind of unbeknown to me. I didn't think they would see it. And they drew down on me and I had a passenger in the car seat. And you know, these years later, I think, well, they had a right to shoot in that car. And you know, given what we know about um, alibis for police officers and uh, lethal force, they probably would have got away with killing me. Um, so I'm thankful to them that they did not, and it was two white officers, I was in Oregon. Um, so I'm thankful to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was in Oregon, you know what that means, all right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the last person I'll thank is a guy named Judge Henry Cantor, who was my sentencing judge. And uh, Henry Cantor could have uh, sent my file across the street to the U.S. State Court, in which case I would have got at least 10 years in a federal penitentiary. But he kept my file in the state court and sentenced me to 16 months in a state penitentiary, which ultimately changed my life. And he and I are actually uh, still in contact. So um, had uh, Judge Cantor not gave me uh, that 16 month sentence. I could have ended up this headline. I think we're on here. Yes. I'm going to be pointing. We're doing a little teamwork back here between me uh, in the back. Yes, that's it. That could have been me. Um, <clears throat> so I ended up, you know, obviously going to prison for a little while. And um, when I came home, re entered the society. Um, Unbeknown to me, I started um, the process of revision. And uh, that is really the heart of what I want to talk to you all about today, is this idea of revision. And you can separate it and think of it as revisioning. Um, so um, before I get to revisioning, I want to talk about editing. Uh, I don't know, I know we have some writers in here. Uh, and, and I don't know what you all think about editing, but I'll define editing as I see it. I think of editing as like seeing the work as static, like it's here in front of you, what do you need to fix? Um, I think of you know fixing like a comma splice or a misspelled word or a subject verb agreement. Um, I think of editing as applying the rules of convention, which also could mean outside of that is like mining the rules of power. Um, I think editing is at its heart a skill, uh, but revision is something else. Um, I think revision is seeing the work in context. You know, I think that revision is also seeing the work in progress. Uh, revision is recognizing the parts of something and how they work to form a whole. Uh, when I think of revision, I think of seeing what could and what should be there and conceiving of ways to make that so. Um, if editing is seeing what's wrong and trying to fix it, then revisioning or revising is discovering what's right and imagining more ways to make it right. Uh, and one of the things that I am always considering in this process of revisioning is what is my philosophy behind why I'm making these decisions. <clears throat> uh, so I want to talk to you all about some people that were also very important in my life. Uh, and what I would like to do is to talk about them in the context of these revision strategies that I often use on the page. Uh, so the first one is this uh, next. Next one, yes. 
This is a, a headline for my friend Kevin. Um, Kevin was, uh, the, I met Kevin in high school and uh, he was an Asian guy at a, uh, a predominantly black high school. And uh, we were on the freshman football team. And I don't know if you all play football, but uh, I was a thin dude in high school. Uh, and not built for football, really. And uh, we had daily doubles. And in daily doubles, we would have to do this thing called the heads up drill. Uh, if you're a football player, heads up is basically like you pop up and try to push each other, other off the line. And you have to have a certain kind of aggressiveness to be good at uh, heads up. I didn't have it. Uh, but Kev would put a battery in my back and, you know, pump me up. Man, you could do it. Go out there, man. Uh, so my first memory of Kevin is of him trying to gas me up during uh, heads up drills. I only played one year of uh, football in high school, but we were undefeated though. I just want to let y'all know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 1990 undefeated freshman team. Uh, <laughs> my last memory of Kevin is when I was in high school and I was dibbling and dabbling in selling various substances. And uh, I had got some really, it was really terrible weed, but I had it. And uh, I was living with my grandfather and I was showing off to Kevin. This is right before we graduated. And uh, my grandmother walked downstairs and she was like, what is this? And I couldn't even think of how to respond. Kev just popped up and said, it's mine, Mrs. Jackson, it's mine. And she was like, you take that stuff and you get out of here and don't you ever come back. And uh, I don't know, this was maybe June, May. Uh, Kev didn't make it through the summer. Um, and so I, I think about uh, the last time that I saw Kev, which that's my last memory, I might have saw him after that, but that's really important to me that he didn't even think twice about trying to save me. Um, Kevin was also a really smart guy. I know it's kind of stereotypical, but he was damn near a math genius. Um, <laughs> really. Uh, but he was also a gang member, as you see this. Uh, and actually, I don't really remember him being a gang member. I remember him wearing gang clothes and signifying as a person who was involved with gangs, but not like a gang member. Um, but I often think what he would have done um, if... Uh, he had kind of bought into this idea that he was a really good student and he wasn't really concerned uh, with gangbanging. And the, the kind of writing philosophy that I would love to give to Kev is this one by Edmund Wilson, which is your wound is your bow. Um, so Ernest Hemingway used to talk about his uh, war wounds and saying that he was stronger at the broken places. Um, and so the reason why I would give this uh, philosophy to Kevin is because I think if he had have took his uh, academic prowess as a strength instead of a weakness, that it could have ultimately altered uh, the course of his life. Um, when I'm uh, kind of writing, um, one of the things I'm always concerned with is like the amount of reading I have or have not done in my life or the amount of language I have or have not under my command. So all of these things I take as a wound. But the other thing is I grew up with these like really um, charismatic speakers in my life. Uh, and being able to listen to them actually turned out to be the thing that ultimately feeds my writing. So in that sense, my wound also became my bow. Uh, so I think if... Uh, we go to this next headline. If Kev had have been able to uh, kind of internalize that uh, philosophy of your wound is your bow, that he might have ended up this headline, the next one. Yes, Portland bred math whiz wins genius grant. They just gave these out. Yeah. Um, okay. Here is another one of my uh, friends. He was like more a friend cousin. Um, they called him Little Smurf. His name was Anthony. We were two years apart and our mothers were like best friends, so we were cousins. Uh, and um, one of the things 
my earliest memory of little Anthony is he had an Audi belly button. Uh, I don't even know if they make those anymore. <laughs> we might have genetically modified the Audi buttons. Uh, but uh, I don't know where I got this from, but somehow I convinced little Anthony that if we tape a nickel, or maybe it was a quarter, over his belly button, that we could push it in. <laughs> right? So I don't know, we about seven, eight. Uh, I taped it over there, you know, I don't know how long. We probably did it for some hours. You probably should have done it maybe like a week. Uh, but uh, you all probably can guess what the outcome of our experiment was. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was my uh, kind of early memory of uh, Lil' Anthony. My last memory of Lil' Anthony is uh, when I was sentenced, the day I was sentenced, Friday the 13th, 1997, a perfect day to go to prison. Um, they took me out of the courtroom and up to some holding tank. And while I'm walking towards the tank, now you know, I'm, sh I'm damn near, I'm trying to hold my tears in. You know, you can't be crying going in the penitentiary. And uh, I hear a voice going, hey, cousin, cousin, what's up? And I was like, what? And it was Lil Anthony in the tank. And he had been, uh, he was already arrested for racketeering and had gone and been sent to San Quentin. And he was back trying to uh, fight his case. And the last words he said to me were, man, I'm trying to beat this. And if they let me out, I'm gone. And uh, that was June. Uh, by October that year, uh, Anthony was this headline. He got into an altercation with someone and got shot in the head and killed. So that was my last time uh, that I saw little Anthony. Um, one of the things that uh, I think about in terms of a philosophy for him is this next screen. Yes, be a master such as you have. Uh, so Lil Anthony was, a, he was a little dude. He never made it up past by five, six, and he was very, very thin, but he was the most audacious gang member we have ever seen. He was also like the funniest and most loving young dude that you could ever be around, if you can imagine that as a, in one person. Um, and so uh, one thing that used to impress me about Lil Anthony is before he grew to five, six, when he was maybe five, two, five, one, he had a car, so he was like 12 with a car, <laughs> and he could not see over the steering wheel, so he would put phone books in the seat to drive his car, so you would see little Anthony in the hood like, man, what are you doing? Uh, but he would be rolling. Uh, and uh, so I, I think in terms of my writing, uh, I am always trying to figure out what is it that I have that is a value in the work, and what is it that I can try to master? Like, I think um, you're often told that the things that are natural to you, that your talents aren't valuable. Um, and so, again, thinking about kind of the voices that I heard, the experiences that I had, the way that I um, see things unorthodox because I didn't don't have the kind of uh, training or didn't have that kind of training, I think that those things have now benefited me. Um, and so. I, uh, I often think about Anthony and like, he was so charismatic. He could have easily been a leader in anything that he did. Um, clearly he was ingenious. He was riding around with phone books <laughs> in his car. So uh, I think if he could have applied um, that kind of uh, ingenuity and charisma and ambition, that he could have had a very different outcome. I think Anthony, was murdered when he was like 21 years old or 20 years old. Uh, no, it was 20. He didn't see his 21st birthday. That's what it was. Um, so I think about that. And uh, if Anthony had have had that idea to be a master such as you have, first of all, he would have had to realize that he had these gifts, right? And then had someone in his life to help him uh, maximize these gifts. He could have been this next one. Yes former gang member founds program for troubled youth. I actually think Lil Anthony could have been like a Tupac too, but I didn't put that up here as a headline. Uh, okay. Uh, the next slide. 
This is my friend Sal. Uh, so Sal was on the other end of a murder. Um, and uh, before that, though, um, I don't. I do have an older brother. He's five months older than me. My dad had three kids in less than a year. None of us got the same mama. You probably figured that out. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, uh, so I do have a five month older brother, but he never, he doesn't seem like an older brother. He's just a guy that's related to me. We're close, but he's not the older, I'm the older brother. Uh, but bless you, I had Sal in my life when I was very young. My earliest memory of Sal was him taking me to basketball tryouts when I was in fifth grade. It was my first time playing organized bas basketball and I was scared. And he took me to the coach, and he said, hey, man, this my little partner. He can play, and he's going to try out. Um, and that was my first time playing ball, and I remember that. Um, he and I also went to high school together. And um, when I was a freshman, he was a sophomore, and he was a starting guard on a basketball team that won a state championship, which was unheard of uh, back then. Uh, in high school, you didn't play as an underclassman of uh, varsity basketball. So he was someone that I looked up to. Uh, Sal was also the person that gave me my first pieces of crack. So on many levels, he kind of inaugurated me into different aspects of my life. Um, the last time that I saw Sal before he went to prison, the last time I remember seeing him, was a uh, strange turn of events. I started selling him product. Uh, and uh, I went out to his house one night because his girlfriend called me and told me that he had had an episode. Um, so I got to his house and he was in his underwear and uh, he had scratches all over his body. And I was like, man, what happened to you? And he said, man, I took some ecstasy last night, and the shit made me go crazy. And so they had uh, police, I guess, had to restrain him. He ended up going to detox. It was a bad, bad episode. And uh, he said, listen, man, don't ever try that shit. And I'm telling you this because I love you. Um, I should mention that Sal is the toughest dude that I have ever seen. Like. Ain't no pumpkin sal, you know? And if uh, it comes to the hands, he's probably going to win. And so for him, who I at that moment thought was physically invincible, was um, uh, there was impenetrable, for him to be that vulnerable with me, for him to call me to the house and let me see him in that way, really changed the nature of our relationship and made me trust him. Uh, in a different way. If we go to this next slide, the thing that I want to impart, or actually have imparted to Sal, is a quote from Gordon Lish, who was uh, an editor that I worked with years ago, who said, what comes next is always behind you. Um, I don't know how many times, I'm actually doing this right now, uh, I have got to the end of something that I'm working on and don't know how to do it. I do not know where to land. And inevitably, my ending came, comes from my opening. And so I think oftentimes we think of futurizing when we get to a space like, well, what's next? But really, what came behind us should inform the next decision that we make. Um, so, uh, this is the information or the philosophy that I would love to impart to Sal, who came home from his 17 years in prison a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, so when I went to go see him after he came home, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I was really careful not to talk about prison with him. Like, I didn't necessarily want to hear, you know, who got beat up and who was doing this and who fell when. Um, so what I talked to him about were things from our shared childhood. Like 
about, man, remember when you took me to go try out for that basketball team? Or, hey, man, how did it feel to win a state championship? Or, you know, so those kind of conversations. Then I did talk to him about that night. He was in his underwear and let me in the house. Uh, and, um, you know, we had a really good laugh. Um, and after we had that conversation, I asked him, you know, well, what's next? Uh, and he went in his closet and he pulled out uh, all of these designs that he had from uh, people that he was incarcerated with, those little sketches. Um, and then he pulled out these T-shirts. Um, and so he had a whole bunch of T-shirts that he had used, the drawings of people that were incarcerated. And he said, man, I'm about to start a T-shirt company. He said, man, come on out back. So we go out back and his mom had a garage, a freestanding garage, and she had given it to him to like create his uh, company uh, factory inside of the garage. And I was like, all right, man, okay. Like, I see you. Um, <clears throat> and this next slide, I think, uh, though I don't like the language ex-con, I think this would be the headline that they gave him, you know? I mean, if there are any journalists in the room, maybe that's something for you to think about, the kind of language we're using in those headlines. Um, but yeah, so uh, I am happy to report that uh, Sal does have his t-shirt company going. Uh, and uh, I absolutely have seen him. You know, this is my big homie. And I want to show you two slides from him. Uh, the next one. Uh, so this is Sal wearing one of his t-shirts, and you probably don't know this guy, but this guy next to him is a guy named Emery Douglas, who is famous, especially in hip-hop circles, for being Jay-Z's best friend. So this is the guy that uh, Jay-Z used to rap about because he took a case for Jay-Z and did like 12 years, and when he came home, he's now an executive in Jay-Z's company. So very much kind of the same thing, well, not very much the same thing, but a similar situation to Sal. So for him to send me this picture, he was out in New York for the first time, uh, this really made me smile. Uh, there's another photo after this. Uh, any basketball heads know who this is? You do? No, that's not Kareem. He's, he got the Laker colors on, he's probably hard to see, and this is New York. That's Walt Frazier right there. You know, that's a legend. Legend. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Sal's not exactly living it up. Um, he's still, you know, dealing with the repercussions of what he did um, in 1997. But uh, I think, you know, looking behind him to see the good in him and the talents that he had and carrying them forth into his present life has served him well. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is an actual headline. This is me. Uh, you can see how old that MacBook is. <laughs> Place it. Yeah. Uh, so you see, wannabe novelist seeks benefactors. I was hot when they ran this. I was like, oh, y'all got me in the hood looking bad. Um, first of all, I'm an old hustler, and you're making me look like a beggar. Uh, the second thing is, you call me a wannabe novelist. Uh, not aspiring, but wannabe novelist. Um, but, you know, after I got over my immediate anger, uh, I thought about um, how much of my revisioning or revisioning uh, needs collaboration and help. Um, and that's another part of revision. At every stage of my development as a, as a writer, there has been someone exposing me to philosophy, teaching me craft, offering me feedback. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very thankful that, well, I'm not, not actually thankful for that damn headline, but I'm thankful <laughs> that I came to that conclusion that I needed collaboration. And for the writers in the room, like, if you don't have an editor or some kind of feedback, you know you are doing, well, I hope you know you are doing yourself a disservice. Um, I know there are writers in the room and there are probably people that are not writers or are not artists. Uh, and so to them, I want to mention this last philosophy. Um, A.K. Kumaraswamy is, uh, the artist is not a special kind of man. Every man 
is a special kind of artist. I'm gonna repeat that one. The artist is not a special kind of man. Every man is a special kind of artist. And in that sense, revision is not just about writing, uh, not just for the people who want to be artists. Um, for years of my life, you know, back when I was hanging out with Sal or Stevie or uh, Kevin, uh, I didn't had no idea that I would become, I didn't even know that this was a possibility to become an artist. What I really wanted to do was stay alive uh, and hopefully get some money in the process. Um, I knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in jail, um, and I sure didn't want to be one of those headlines that make your mama cry. Um, and mostly I got lucky because those guys who pulled pistols on me didn't pull triggers, um, because the, the officers said drop it and didn't shoot when they could have, um, because my family and my coaches uh, and my uncles uh, and my grandfather and my mother um, all really uh, helped me in times when I didn't have a, uh, a kind of sense of where to go. Uh, and because of all of those kindnesses, uh, here I am standing before you. My good fortune is the sum of their many kindnesses or gifts or something. Uh, I want to show you this. There we go. There are all of our mug shots. Lil Smurf, Sal, Kev, me. I think I look the most shook out of everybody. Uh, you know, I mean, you can judge for yourself. Um, so I want to ask this room something. Uh, you know, I know there are a lot of people who here who are already involved in social justice and helping people with reentry. Uh, but I also want to ask you, is there anything more that you can do? Uh, to ask you, how are we going to next help the next Kevin or Anthony or Sal or even the next young me, um, who, the person who doesn't even know that they're an artist, uh, see themselves in context, uh, to see their lives in progress, to discover what's right about themselves and make it more right. Uh, the question that I wanna leave you with is how do we in this room continue or advance the ways in which we help people revise? Thank you. Uh, I heard there was some Q&A. I don't actually know how much time we have, or, uh, but I'm, if y'all want to chat, I'm, I'm down to chat. We got time? Yeah, OK. Oh, we got a mic for y'all. OK, some high tech stuff going on here. <laughs> oh, I think it's for the video. Yeah. Recording. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got to come to you the. Come on up. Oh. We are. Consequences of raising your hand first, huh? Yeah. So, why do you think you took the path you did when you got out of prison instead of going back to your old life? Um. Well, I did. Uh, I. Um, I don't think I sold any more crack. Uh, almost sure about that. Uh, I knew the penalty. I had done the research on federal drug laws. Uh, but I absolutely sold some weed. And uh, a couple of times almost was arrested for that. Um, but I think the thing that kept me was that I was a college student when I went to prison. And they held my scholarship for me. And so I returned to college basically a month after I got out of prison. I was back in school. And so having something to look forward to, uh, something that I had to commit to, uh, was very helpful for me. But I don't want to give the impression that I just went to prison and like life was changed. It, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. Um, 
I remember coming home and maybe this is, you know, I think it's different when you're struggling, like if you go to prison and you're like struggling with addiction and you know, you might be homeless or you're living place to place and you know, but if you go to jail and or prison and you're making some money, that's a different kind of reentry. Uh, because when I came home, there were still the same people who needed their bills paid, you know, my Lexus needed new tires, you know, I got a Rolex, but no money in my pocket. So I think that's a different kind of, um, a different set of circumstances that a person has to navigate uh, because you have those kind of pressures on you. Um, and so I don't know what are, what's in place for that, but I think, you know, that, that was my circumstance rather than, you know, maybe going to a, a, a NA program or something, which I had to do that too because I was a drug dealer, but definitely I felt the pressure of, well, how are you gonna hold us up? Boy, y'all got quiet. Don't nobody want to come up and get the mic now. I know what it is. I could actually repeat the yeah, question. Yeah, yes, we can do I that can do too. That. We can repeat the question. Yes, yeah, I'll yeah. repeat them. I'll repeat them. I'll save y'all. So I work at a local high school here. I'm a student advocate. Okay. And you and I don't look a lot alike. No. But I work with a lot of students that think that this lifestyle, um, the old this lifestyle of these guys up here, uh -huh. is looks pretty cool. And I'm just okay. wondering how can I, mm -hmm. as a white educator, um, talk to students about what has happened to you and the alternatives? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think one is to ask yourself what is your, what's the nexus of your reasoning for want, wanting to work with them? Um, and I say that because I think, you know, it's, I think it's easy to kind of veer into the area of a white savior. Um, and I think we should be guarding against that. Uh, so, you know, to examine how pure is this intention. The other thing is um, uh, to, to put, or to, to have as many um, credible messengers uh, speak to them as you can. So maybe it's not, you necessarily, maybe you're the conduit to putting them in contact with credible messengers. Because ultimately, it's, I can't speak for every community, but I can speak for at least the black community in Northeast Portland, like credibility is everything. And if you don't have it, they, it's like, who are you talking to? Like, they can't necessarily hear you. But I do think that you can put yourself in contact with people who they will hear and surround them with them as much as you can and then I'll always be asking myself like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Yeah. He shouted out. I'm he repeating, I'm repeating. He, he can repeat. oh, I can repeat it, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I have a basketball question. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, at low times in my life, in my early 20s, mm -hmm. um, basketball saved my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Huh. Wow. Uh, Okay, so I had this conversation with a guy named John Edgar Weidman, who all of you should read. He has a really great book. I mean, he got like 30 great books, but he has a great book called Brothers and Keepers about his brother and uh, mass incarceration before it was even a thing to call it. Um, and we were talking about playing basketball and how much improvisation is involved in basketball and how it's really a kind of artistry um, that, you know, you learn the fundamentals just like you learn how to edit, but then in the moment of playing, what you're doing is improvising, right? And so the greatest ball players are the per players who have the greatest athletic gifts and then can improvise the best. Um, and so I think there's something spiritual about improvisation because you don't think about it, right? It's like you do something so often 
that it becomes natural for you. And then in that moment, you, you kind of use what you need in that moment. So I think in that way, uh, basketball was kind of spiritual, though I wasn't, uh, I don't know if I was that good. I mean, I played junior college basketball and I would like to think I was a great ball player, but I played junior college basketball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so I don't know if I ever got to that kind of level of athletic spirituality. Uh, but I do, I do think it's, I do think it's possible. Um, and in terms of like thinking about that as a way to revise, like a lot of these things came to me after the fact when I was kind of examining decisions I was making. In while it was happening, I was s swimming in muck um, a lot of the times, and just I don't want to go back to prison. That was like the thing in my head. I'm not going back to prison. You know, I just I can't do it. Uh, and not that I can't do time, because I think I can do time. It's just I don't want that to be the marker of my life. Uh, and so while you maybe had these things all figured out, like I didn't, I didn't have them figured out. But I do got a nice jumper, though. I just want to tell you that. You know, I go left, dunk left, dunk right. You know, 20 years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, yo, yes, yes, Elaine. Um, how and when did I discover my gifts as a writer? Um, well, I don't even know if I thought they were gifts for a very long time. Like, I was out of two graduate writing programs before I ever thought, oh, this is a gift. Um, I thought I had a talent, but I think a gift is something else. Um, I think a gift is something that you can do that's exceptional. Uh, and so I was working with an editor named Gordon Lish in 2008. This is again after two MFA programs and teaching a lot of classes all over New York City. And um, he had worked with so many great writers and he took uh, a liking to me and he would encourage me. He would like leave me messages on my answer machine like three in the morning like, Jackson, you could be great. Stick with me, Jackson. I'll get you there. <laughs> like, literally, that's how his voice sounds, Jackson. Uh, and I started to believe it. You know, it's like a good coach. I was like, yeah. Gordon said I'm going to be great. Uh, so really, that, that was it. But it was also, he gave me so much philosophy. Like, I had a lot of teachers who were telling me, this is what you do in this situation. You know, you got two people talking. Like, don't make them answer each other. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good rule. But Gordon was telling me, here's why you're doing this. This is the philosophy behind this, you know? And so that changed things because then I had a philosophy to navigate a certain circumstance. Whereas before I had a, a skill set, now I knew why I was deploying a certain thing. And so if you ask me about any page of my writing, I could go at least sentence for sentence and tell you why every decision was made in that sentence. Um, and so, but that comes out of philosophy, right? Because one writer has a different set of values than another writer, so they would make a different decision, but do they know why they did this? Um, and it's not just logic, it's not just this is what I have to say. So I think it took me to 2008, which is, I'm 10 years in, 12 years in, to like thinking about this as a career before I thought, oh, I can do something that's particular. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm wondering how your incorporation in the Southeast Asia writing school has impacted your, your family or your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I had people who were very supportive while I was down. I had a partner who came to see me every single weekend, so every visit, like people used to look out the window like, here she come, man, she, she on her way, and I, I don't know what I would have done without that. Um, I had people who believed in me because I was, you know, still in college. Um, but again, I don't think they understood the kind of pressure 
that I had to kind of maintain a certain stature. Um, but I, I also think, man, I got so many people in my family that's done time. Like, I'm not special. You know, it's like, you know, I'm out and my two cousins is in and my uncle doing life and my, you know, like, really, who cares? You know, like, yeah, you home, stay home. You know, like, you were smart enough not to do this, Mitchell. So it's, it was kind of like that with me, which is a different circumstance than, than like maybe other families. But, you know, like, I think people were more disappointed in me and surprised about my circumstance. And they were like, you need to handle that versus someone else who they thought was struggling uh, in other areas of their life and that they needed to lend them a hand in, in some way, which, you know, I hope it worked. Um, but yeah, I don't think, in, in terms of the way that mass incarceration has infected, affected my family, like mom, uncles, grandfather, cousins, you know, like everybody didn't, been touched up. I mean, my brother just got out of jail three days ago, you know, so like, here we are. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yes. Oh, when people get out of prison uh, and they're not allowed to vote, and then also how uh, did it how was my kind of journey trying to find a job? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Well, one, I didn't want to work, uh, but I did. Uh, I let's see. The first first job that I got out of prison was working. Uh, so my my uh, undergraduate deg undergraduate degree is in speech communications. I thought I was going to be a news anchor. Even after I came home from prison, I'm like I'm going to be a news anchor, mainly because I wanted to wear suits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I went to this, uh, we had like one black news anchor, because again, this is Portland, Oregon. And uh, I knew him, because again, this is Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and I went to Ken, and I was like, Ken, I saw that they have an internship at, at your uh, station. Like, can you put in a good word for me? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, man. Just come down, fill out the app, and you know, put my name down. And I did. And I got an internship working at KOIN, the CBS affiliate in Portland, uh, making six twenty-five an hour. Uh, working about third, 25, you know, hours a week. I can't even fill up the tank in my Lexus off of this. Uh, but I was working, uh, and that led to me getting another job. So uh, really, like, having advocates and people who were, one of the things that I think that I have been, f I don't even know if this is, this is not a talent, but one of the things that is a part of my character is I will always make the ask. Um, I think a lot of people are scared. You can call it audacity, maybe, but like I will always ask. You're gonna have to tell me no. You probably gonna have to say it a couple times in different languages before I accept that that is a no. And so I would just like, why would I be calling up this news anchor that I hoop with one Saturday? You know, like that we didn't have a real relationship. Um, so I was fortunate in that that I would make the ask, and then maybe people kind of respecting that wow, he really just asked me for that, would, would do something for me. In terms of voting, I was not politically engaged, so it didn't really matter to me whether or not I could vote. I mean, I knew when I got out. Actually, I never even checked. It was just a rumor that while I was incarcerated when I came home that I could not vote. And I don't know when they gave me my rights back. I just went and voted, and I guess now I could have been locked up for it. Um, but... You know, so it took me, I think when we talk about re-enfranchising voters, we're also making the case that these are voters to begin with, that they want to vote, and that they're informed enough to make a decision in the voting process. So that takes political engagement. So uh, I forgot who was telling me about uh, that they have like some training for when you're about to come home about the political system. I mean, like, who's taking civics and political theory in the streets? Right. You know? Like, no one's doing that. So, I mean, I, we need the right, but then we also need to make sure that we're creating people who are actually civically involved enough and astute enough to make good decisions. Uh, yes?
Mm-hmm. Um, I think it should be in prison. Uh, why not give them an opportunity? Uh, we didn't have college. They took college away from us by the time I was there. But uh, there was a program called PATH, which I, Pathfinders, I can't remember what it stood for, but uh, it was a class that I had to take as part of my programming. And I remember, I think the teacher got sick or s somehow couldn't show up. And so I ended up teaching that class. Uh, and those were the first classes that I ever taught. Um, and then, you know, all these years later, I've now been a professor almost 20 years. Um, so uh, I think that was valuable that I had that experience. Thankful to that woman who caught a cold and didn't want to come in. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's really important to engage someone intellectually while they're down, to give them, um, you know, the opportunity to do that. Uh, I know there are a lot of prison writing programs. I do a lot of work with the Penn uh, program. And I, would, I think there's, there's uh, we, as, as much as I can see, there's a lot of like, well, just write your story down. And I think there's a kind of catharsis that happens when you give someone an opportunity to write their story down. They, you know, it feels good. Uh, but I would also like to see higher standards of aesthetics applied to what is made. Because you might have an artist and you are satisfied with making a journalist. Not a journalist as in like a news reporter, but a person who writes in journals. Um, and so, you know, I was an artist in prison. You don't just become an artist, right? But had I taken a prison writing program and someone said, hey, write about the time your mom left you four days to go on a binge, that's not art. Um, and so I would uh, advocate if you are working in these spaces to push them in the aesthetics of what they're doing, to make artists, not just people who have a story and write it down. Uh, don't let that be the only currency. Yes? Did you ever think of yourself as an actual criminal, or did you think of yourself as someone who got screwed by the drug war? Uh, well, I, don't, I didn't have enough context for drug war, uh, and I think that's probably by design that you know the average dude on the corner doesn't know about the drug war and all the mechanisms that put him there, uh, you know. So, uh, but no, I didn't really think of myself as a criminal. I thought of myself as a part of a culture that made this a means of survival. Yeah. Uh, I, once, you, once you buy into criminal, you, like, you're pretty much done, right? Because that's like a whole kind of moral uh, acceptance that that like it bleeds into everything else, right? Like if you are a criminal, that means you accepted that you're a bad person, and then you know what else won't you do? Uh, so no, I never, I never bought into that. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so I had several members of my family who were incarcerated. Do I think federal mandatory sentencing laws had something to do with why they were incarcerated? Not the particular people that I named. Do I think that that has something to do with like hundreds of thousands of people being incarcerated? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and then we can get into what's a violent crime, what's not a violent crime. So yeah, yeah, obviously we need to do a lot more in terms of reimagining what punishment is. Uh, you know, people getting 10 years for a murder, but 20 years for a sack of cocaine. I mean, but you know, we preaching to the choir here. I know y'all know this, y'all here. <laughs> you know? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, in the back. Yes. I've lived in Chicago. I know it's very, it's a 
particular population uh -huh. here in uh, uh, Waterloo Beach uh, mm -hmm. is a very different population. And um, it, I know also within the entire city, um, there are also pockets of, of different cultures mm -hmm. that see the world very differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Working with this population, how do you feel the connections are made, and then how, what, what guidance might that feel like to us about who are trying to help people feel connected across countries? Okay, okay. All right, so I'm going to try to paraphrase that. So, uh, University of Chicago has gentrified Hyde Park, <laughs> and how do I see my role as a professor? Connecting to the elite students. Is that, is that it? Is that, I'm, just, I'm asking. I don't, I don't know. I want to make sure I got it right. Is that it? Okay. Uh, one, uh, I haven't started teaching yet. Uh, I was on faculty at NYU, New York University, for 16 years, uh, which is a similar thing, right? Like it's right in the village, which that's not really the hood, but you know, it's, you go up a little bit, you go down a little bit, you can get to the hood. Um, I think my job as a professor is to keep it 100 in the classroom all of the time. Um, and I say that because I'm radicalizing any intellectual space that I'm in. Um, I plan to do that at University of Chicago, which is maybe even more important because they are more elite than NYU, or elite in their thinking. Um, and don't snitch on me. But I think that uh, elitism is like a terrible thing. Uh, and I think, you know, we don't, or maybe I'm just not reading enough, but I don't think a lot of people talk enough about the relationship between not just uh, privilege, but the idea of whites as supreme that is connected to institutions of higher education. Um, you know, look at Harvard. I'll just single out somebody else, not University of Chicago. You look at Harvard, uh, who's like 52% of the students there, are like, wouldn't be there if not for legacy. You know, so, uh, I mean, clearly there's some balls in play uh, to keep, uh, to connect um, those kind of elite students or elite culture and to maintain elite culture. And so I think when I go into a room, it's really imperative of me to show them all of the sides of me, not just the academic side of me, for me to challenge their ideas of them being elite or special. Um, I remember being in a room, I forgot, it was some like really important writer, and he said, man, you know the problem is, everybody think they special. You ain't special? And I was like, shit. I ain't special. Um, so I think you have to be able to maintain that, right, as an ethos. You ain't special, but also maintain that you are, right? So like how do you kind of move through the world maintaining that paradox? I ain't special. No, I am special. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> oh, we got one more. Okay, uh, this is it. <laughs> You're the one. Um, you had mentioned about teaching classes since while you were incarcerated. Uh -huh. Did they offer any hindered teaching or teaching like job readiness courses or anything that would prepare you to overcome the labels or answer the selling question when you came home to get hired for jobs? I, yeah, I did. I think Pathfinders was one of those kind of courses. Like, but nobody can really prepare you for the moment where you actually need the job and you see the question. Like, there is the moment there. Like, it's good simulating, but like, now I actually need this job. What am I going to do? And I put no and let, you know, let them check it and do all that. Uh, but then I started, you know, what is that? Uh, we'll discuss, you know? I'll tell you what saved me. Maybe this is good. Y'all tell these, everyone go in higher education because they don't ask for that shit in higher education. 
Uh, so when I figured out that all they needed was my CV, I was like, oh, this is it. That's why I'm a professor. <laughs> um, I think my time is, uh, has run out. I will say I signed a bunch of books and left them in the back. And I'm about to jet to a, a plane because I got a reading tonight in New York. I made too many commitments. Uh, so I'm not like being an asshole if I just <laughs> breeze. But I really enjoy this time here in Iowa in the eye mirror and uh, all these great questions. Thank you.